All right, this here is the Liquid Freezer 2. It's one of the value kings. Big, thick, rad for big performance. Uh, today, we get the next iteration in this family. This guy is the Liquid Freezer 3. Welcome to Machines and More. So the LF2 has been one of those stalwart coolers, not only in the price to performance department, but also in the flat out performance arena. I reviewed the LF2 many years ago and it has always been a top tier performer, albeit it does use a more typical 38 millimeter thick radiator, which may be challenging to fit in many systems. Now that radiator was coupled with high performance Arctic P12 fans, and it also has plenty of niceties such as a small motherboard cooling fan on the pump block, and that's intended to cool the area around the CPU socket, such as the VRM, the RAM. Uh, the LF3 improves on the two in many ways, and that's what we're going to take a look at today. So quick note, big thanks to Arctic for their support. Arctic did provide this cooler free of charge for the purposes of this review, but I'm not paid by them for this review. They don't have input into the testing or testing methodology, neither do they have advanced notification of any of the review findings. And then we'll see this at the same time you do. So the one I have here for this review is the non-ARGB 240. There will also be a black or white ARGB version, which has lighting on the pump block and the P12 ARGB fans. Uh, but what I have always liked about the LF2 is just how clean and no nonsense business like this is. Uh, it, it just works. So I really prefer the black version here. Now with all color options, there's also going to be 280, 360, and even 420 millimeter radiator versions. So lots to choose from. With this version, we still have the thick sleeve tubing that hides the fan cabling. Um, it peaks out the end of the radiator right here, okay? So that's gonna connect to both of the P12 fans are pre-connected and you will not need a splitter cable. And yes, they are the same P12 fans. Now with the ARGB versions, you do get the ARGB versions of the P12 or the P14, which are actually quite a bit different compared to the non-RGB P12s. Still have that 38 millimeter radiator on the pump block, same size cold plate as before, 40 millimeters by 44 millimeters. And this cold plate is actually smaller than the Intel LGA 1700 IHS size, so a little bit strange. You still have a VRM fan with this, but what's improved is that the VRM fan, it's bigger, okay? And it spins from 400 to 2500 RPM. It's a bigger fan here, a little propeller. And that sits in a separate pump cover, which will click into place magnetically. Okay, just like that. The three also updates one of the pain points with the two which is that the thick braided tubing came straight out of the pump block and that made bending or orienting things difficult sometimes. So here, yeah, we got all those, just nice. Okay. The internals of the cold plate itself, they're different. I didn't open it up because then I would you know, lose the coolant, but Arctic mentioned additional heat pin volume here as well as improved water channels. And you'll see the difference that those make when we get to the performance testing. So to mount the unit for AM4 and AM5, you're gonna use these um, mounting bars, okay? And left and right, and then you'll screw the pump block down to these. If you look at the retention mechanism here, it's concave. Okay, so as you tighten these two bolts down, Theoretically, that flexes it into a flat position and that'll help ensure even contact. So that's a change there. For Intel, it's a biggie to note that you only have support for LGA 1700. So your current Intel 12th, 13th, 14th gen sockets. Uh, I'd imagine there are still quite a few folks on prior generations. Uh, so fortunately, there's no support for those. Maybe they've done their homework and said, yeah, you know, there's not enough users to be uh, worth it anymore since it actually would take quite a bit more work here because their implementation of LGA 1700 is more complicated than just your typical backplate with standoffs. You know, just It's not just drilling extra holes in that backplate to mount a standoffs for the uh, previous Intel uh, sockets. So you do have to remove the motherboard retention bracket and once you place your CPU in place and you replace it with Arctic's contact frame. Now, this is 
you know, it's not necessarily more work than usual with Intel mounts, but it is very, very different. And for someone setting up a system for the first time, or you're kind of new to this, it, I can imagine this would be daunting because you do have to be careful that your CPU stays in place the whole time in order to avoid damaging any of the socket pins and you're, you know, modifying the motherboard essentially. Um, Arctic does say that this will improve the cold plate mounting pressure on the CPU, uh, given that your usual Intel loading mechanism is only two points at the middle. Uh, the stock Intel loading mechanisms has actually been shown by many other tests to result in performance variation when it comes to cooling performance. So this type of contact frame has been a popular mod that users can add on for LGA 1700 and you get one included with this AIO, which you might think it's nice, but it also governs how you can install the pump block, unfortunately. And it's only in the elbows down position. It goes in like this. And if you were to try to go the other direction, you know, it does not sit in here. You know, it does not fit. So I'll only go um, elbows down. And on a mini ITX board, for example, that tends to overlap the M.2 heatsink. You know, once that heatsink is tall enough, this, you can't install it at all, okay? So what I tested with uh, for the installation, the MSI Z690i makes contact with the elbow part, but it does, it is able to mount. Um, there, there's gonna be plenty of Z690i or Z790i boards where this actually will not fit. AMD installs, you do have a choice of two positions. You either go elbows up or elbows down. With board sizes north of Mini ITX, you shouldn't have a big issue one way or another. But just as an example, the board in my NR200 test system is ASUS's X570 ITX. Elbows down is not gonna happen because of that taller M.2 heatsink and elbows up is the only possible orientation at that point though. It's awfully close to the top fans in that case. So it's really a balancing act. So, you know, some other boards don't have the same socket position. So if you are gonna be running with smaller boards and smaller cases, so you really do need to be cautious you know, that layout just may not work for you. Just be uh, aware of that. Uh, for AM5, there's also no option for offset mounting, which was something they added later on with the Luca Freezer 2. That can potentially improve thermals. I did some testing with this with Noctua's uh, offset mounting bars. And that's because of the positioning of where Ryzen 7000 CCDs are located in the IHS, relative to the IHS. The included thermal paste has also been updated to the latest and greatest MX6 as well. So that's nice. First of for cables, you do have two options. You can run a single cable and a plug into the pump unit that uh, plugs into one header on your motherboard. So that most likely will be the CPU fan header if you choose to do it that way. And then the MOBA fan, the pump speed, that will all be tied into the curve you set for your radiator fans on that header, noting that at about 80% PWM, your pump will be running at full speed. And um, that's one way to do it. Alternately, you can run a three-way cable like I've done here, okay? And then you'll have individual control of the rad fans, the MOBO fan, and the pump speeds. And you will need enough fan headers for that though. Other than that, the fans and fan cables, they're completely pre-installed and it's there. <laughs> there's really no clutter here. You only need to switch the fans around if you choose to change the airflow orientation, which I did. Uh, these are default installed in an exhaust position if you have it against an outwards facing case panel. Noise normalized testing as a side intake in the Cooler Master NR200 test system, which has a 5800X at 4.6 gigahertz and 1.25 volts. The unit is very good. And compared to its predecessor, there is a good improvement here. And if you think about it, this is going to be from the redesigned pump block. Uh, we are using the same P12s here. So this isn't really a factor. Now, some of its thinner rad peers perform quite well also, but this is definitely a strong performance. Next noise level here, it's still an improvement over the LF2. Again, all very good performers here. And the performance with the LF3 is very much in line with these other top units. And I think that's the big takeaway here. I also wanted to show you the max level of performance that's that the unit is capable of uh, when the fans are maxed out. So one thing is the P12s equipped with the LF3 and LF2, they don't go past 1800 RPM. There's the stock P12s. However, they are very quiet. And at max speed, there isn't much performance deficit versus the competition, but at, uh, at least at this power level, acoustically, this is a very large difference. And I can see why they stuck with this noise level just to avoid any complaints about noise. Now, I'm a little curious though, why we didn't make a move towards the P12 max. 
you know, at least a, a modified version of those, especially since at equal noise levels, those P12 Max perform quite a bit better than the P12s, but maybe that is a revision that's already in the works for the future. Uh, one thing you do get the P12s, sometimes there is an odd hum, and it varies which RPM level you find that at. Uh, these had them at a, at the mid-high mid, mid -high range. You can kind of hear a little bit of a drone there. That's not terrible. Uh, when I tested the P12 Max, though, that, that was not a phenomenon that, uh, that I experienced. So that could have been an improvement in the noise department if they had gone with those. But take a quick listen, and I'll also give you a reference here for the pump and the VRM fan noise. So that MOBO cooling fan is not going to be very noticeable as long as you are running a similar curve next to your CPU fans. But when everything else is at a very low level and you somehow have that thing running at 100%, then yeah, I guess you could tell that something is on, but really it's it's not a biggie. So it does do something though. It's just not a gimmick. Uh, even in a scenario like I have tested this one in when, when where it's a side intake, basically, you know, you've got air blowing at the motherboard from the side mounted radiator. 60% of the VRM fans versus 100%. I'm just using the chipset temps here as a proxy here to show you, you know, there's a small gap, but it's there. So interestingly with the LF2, the temps were a bit higher. Is this type of thing going to be a big deal? You know, typically not. Um, if your board cooling is truly terrible, like uh, you have a super, super budget board or your airflow around the board is somehow close to non-existent, then yeah, maybe it can make a significant difference there. Uh, but typically speaking, your VRM and your board temps, they're going to have to get pretty high before they become a real issue or real impediment. But, you know, suffice to say, this fan does not hurt. You heard it. It's not, it's not very loud. So if you really, really don't want it running, you can just limit it with its own fan curve they've given you the option to do that now which is uh, an improvement here so a couple of things to watch out for in spite of the elbows added to the pump like the way they've sleeved the tubing it's still very very stiff compared to some other units on the market um, so in addition to the thicker rad here and the inflexible pump mounting orientation you may find yourself needing more clearance in space simply because of this tight tubing still uh, previously, the LF2 was a tight fit in the NR200. The LF3, it actually does fit a little bit better, although I'd say things are still pretty tight. And one area that could potentially improve the fit further is articulating elbows at the radiator end also. We touched on LGA 11.5X and 1200 support being dropped, which is a bummer. Also, I get that this is a less flashy unit here, but you know, when, when you've got this installed elbows up, for example, you're actually stuck with the orientation of that Arctic logo. And so you can't rotate this so that it's facing up. And I really would like to see a little bit more freedom in orienting the pump itself so that users can get the right fit and the right tubing run. So, you know, I, I could, you know, couldn't care less about the, uh, the logo orientation if I can't see the logo, but it really matters if I can't install this at all, right? So I would also like to see this updated potentially with the P12 Max in the future. I think that that would be your logical improvement there. If unbridled noise is a concern with those higher RPM fans, keep in mind they do go to 3300 RPM, well, you can just limit the RPM for that uh, specific model that you implement with the AAO's uh, addition. And I think that would really leverage Arctic strengths. Um, I'd also like to see the addition of an offset mount for AM5. So it could be as simple as a second set of mounting bars or, you know, just second set of holes here um, it, it would be just an option right the user doesn't have to necessarily adopt it i do think that elbows up or elbows down both of those positions can look a little bit odd visually but you know it, it works at the end of the day the good news is overall this lf3 continues the excellent arctic 
price to performance. And uh, I will leave the MSRPs for each of the SKUs down in the description. But MSRP for this one, it's going to come in pretty similar to the Alf 2's price. So your closest comparison, I think, in terms of performance and the feature set would be EK's Nucleus 240 Dark. They do perform very similarly. The performance with that one should be the same as the uh, Nucleus 240 ARGB that I uh, tested with here. Uh, perhaps you do have a slight edge to the EK for noise normalized performance and max RPM, but the EK is a bit more in terms of the pricing. The warranty here is six years, which is quite good for an AAO. The top ones are around five to six years, so this is in that uh, top tier. So yeah, to sum it up, this is still one of the best AIOs out there in terms of value and uh, the updated performance makes it a serious one to consider. So it is a bit restrictive for mounting and placement, but if this one fits in your build, I think it's definitely one to consider. And so I hope you found this review helpful. If so, please give a like, subscribe if you haven't already. I'll go ahead and leave product links down below when available. A big thanks for watching today.